Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch, and today we are looking at yet another game engine. This one is the Spartan game engine, and should you use this? Absolutely not. Should you know about it? Definitely, and that's why I have this video. So what we're going to do today is jump in and take a look at the Spartan game engine, and I'm going to explain to you why you should know about this one, and you should especially know about this one if you are interested in creating your own game engine. This is an open source MIT licensed project. The guy behind it, as far as I understand the story, actually got his job from this engine. He now works at Codemasters, uh, and this is his personal uh, kind of a rendering itch scratch kind of project. It is entirely in the open source. And what we're going to do, take a look at the um, the Windows side of things, the editor, then we're going to jump in and take a look at the code. There's nice separation between the uh, editor or IDE that you're seeing right now and then the back end game engine code. But we're going to look at the, the eye candy stuff first. So here you can see the world as it's defaulted out. And what I'm going to do is just bring something into the world. So I've imported a Sponza level. This is from the G3D Innovation Engine project. And you can see here, we're just doing a standard OBJ file import. And what you're going to find right away is that it does a really good job of uh, importing models. So I'm going to just bring this guy in and we're going to change the size up a little bit because that's, uh, that's really tiny. So let's go ahead and 0.001 0, 0, and 0.001. All right, there we go. So we brought in, imported this 3D model, and let me just go take a look inside of it. So if you've ever done any rendering, all right, I got that way too sensitive. I'm going to just go ahead and scale it up one more time. 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01. All right, there we go. It's probably of the right size now. You've probably seen this level in the past. The cool thing what you're noticing here is it came in and immediately just worked. And it looks beautiful right off the hop. Now, you've got a lot of um, rendering grunt behind the scenes here. So I can come up here, for example, and we can see the various different options that are available to us. And you're starting to see what the rendering features of this engine are. Uh, we've got various different tone mapping options. So, for example, I can switch between Aces, uh, Reinhardt, Uncharted 2's approach, or none at all. I'm gonna go back to Aces. We can also change the amount available right there. And then you've got a number of different settings. You've got Bloom, you've got Depth of Field, which be honest, I actually find a little bit buggy right now. Motion Blur, Volumetric Fog, you can turn on and off and increase the amount of, like so. Uh, you've got Screen Space, um, Shadows, Ambient Occlusion, Global Illumination and Reflections, Chromatic Aberration, Temporal Anti-Aliasing, uh, Fast Approximation, Anti-Aliasing, Film Grain Sharpening, and Dithering Support all in here. So you've got all of the, the modern graphics that you're expecting. You've got a traditional PBR-based workflow for creating shaders and materials. You have a real-world lighting module. So let me just go up here. We'll, we'll just make that one a lot smaller. So for example, here, you go to the camera, you're going to find you have uh, traditional camera settings such as shutter speed, ISO, and aperture. Uh, so you can you can tweak those to your heart's content. So let's do a 60 degree aperture instead. And we can change the shutter speed. It'll change the amount of light that comes in. You can change the ISO of the scene. Uh, we've also got control over for your lighting settings. You're using real units. So you've got uh, actual intensity. You can change out the color of things. We can go ahead and create a new light in the scene easy enough. So I can come up here, create, and what you're noticing here is I can create an empty object and then compose it myself. Or I could create something like a point light in our scene like I just did right there. So let's go ahead and select that guy. So we can create a point light and there you can see the effects of the light like so. But the point light here is created out of a transform and a light component. Same way as if I go back to the camera, you're going to notice the camera is made out of a transform, a camera, and then an audio listener. So I could add, if I really wanted to for some strange reason, I could add an audio file to my light here. So I could go ahead here and go audio and make that an audio source. And then our camera is going to pick it up based on proximity and so on. Everything is using real world lighting units. Um, so you can kind of recreate the world as it stands. Uh, just I did not mean to select into spawns here. You also got the ability to create primitives. So let's go ahead here. We're going to create a 3D object of type. Um, let's make a sphere like so. All right, so there we go. Sphere is created. Now we can do some neat things. Let's go back to the root of our project right here. I could go ahead. So we got standard material there. I'm going to just go ahead in here and go create and create a new material. So I have now have new material. And I mesh apply here. I'm going to drop my new material onto our sphere there. And now let's go ahead and edit this material. So straightforward. So this is a texture I downloaded from CC0 Textures. Uh, let's drop something in the color channel and then you're gonna see the results in real time. This is roughness, okay, right there. Uh, we have a normal channel right here. And then we have an ambient occlusion map right here. And everything that we were dealing with, we've got controls over. So for example, if I wanna change the normal amount, I could do so right there. So you got a real-time uh, uh, PBR-based workflow uh, 
camera, uh, sorry, uh, texture settings going on here. Also, if you come up here, there is a real-time shader editor available as well, which is kind of cool. Uh, you got some debugging and profiling tools here as well, uh, kind of show you how, how things are working, what memory is being consumed, and how long things are taking. And that is kind of the shader editor. While I'm in here, let me just go ahead and I'll create one more thing. This takes a little bit of time, uh, but it'll illustrate what you could do. Then I'll go back and do another example. So here I am in my world, root selected. I'm going to go ahead and create a new train object like so. And now for the train object, what I need to do, let's go back to my root and I'll drop a height map into there and we'll do the generate. So this is going to take a little bit of time. I'll let it run. And let's go back in here to our sphere and we'll show you a little bit more how the anti-component system works. So... Here we go. One thing I do really wish is that Q and E were up and down. I've kind of gotten so used to that, that positioning the camera here is, is tricky at times. All right, so there's my sphere. Let's move it up a little bit in the world. With it selected, now I'm gonna go down here. We're gonna add a component to it. And we're gonna add type of physics. You got a number of different options for physics. You've got physics constraints like hinges and so on, soft bodies. So we're just gonna do really simple in this case. Create a rigid body on this guy. There's no mass, so nothing is going to happen with it yet. And then we'll create another one. And this is going to be uh, the collider for it. And obviously, we will go with sphere. So you can see, we now have a spherical um, collider on this guy. And since there's no mass, if I press play, nothing is going to happen. But let me go ahead and add something else into our world. So root. By the way, you'll notice train is still plugging away in the background and generating. So you do have like a multi-threading approach here, which is nice. So back to my root. Create another 3D object of type cube. All right, there we go. So make sure that we are underneath the sphere. Yeah, underneath enough. All right, so we're going to grab it. We're going to add a component onto it of type physics. Uh, yeah, rigid body. This one is not affected by gravity. Also, a collider on this guy, physics, collider. And we'll make that one a box. Yeah, so we're good to go. And now that we have physics in our world, let's go back and select our... Oh, our train just showed up. And it, it's it's over top of my demo. All right, so I'm just going to grab my train for a second. Hit the all right, train, W key. Where is, where is your manipulator? But, all right, so back here, oops, back here, so there's my train, let me just drop my train down a little bit so I'm not in my world, but there you can see, it created a train for us, which is very, very nice, so back to my physics demonstration that my train so rudely interrupted, all right, so there we go, we got there, so grab our sphere, right, so, and we will turn our uh, mass up so we have some, and go ahead and simulate, and there you see, we have a physics system in here. And as you can see from what it just showed us a minute ago, we also have full terrain. So that is um, just a quick look at the editor side of the Spartan game engine. Next thing we're going to do is take a look at the code side. And there's some really cool stuff going on here. And the reason why I recommend Spartan so heavily is more the code than the, um, the engine itself. Because the code is really well organized. You're going to notice here, it is split into two sides. You've got your editor and your runtime. To get started with this guy, super easy. Just clone the repository and run the bat file to create your solution. Open the solution up and then you'll be here. So you've got the editor, which would also be where your game is so if you want to create your own game using this one just basically start modifying the editor source code and it is decoupled from the runtime which is on the other end if i look start looking at the project the runtime you're going to see things like core this is where the game engine itself exists all right so let's walk through this process of how you kind of get into uh, a spartan project and it all starts here in editor predictably enough in main. Main is your entry point, so if you're a C++ programmer, you are well aware of main. On Windows, main is actually WinMain, but you're going to see it comes in here, and we do a couple of key things. We create an editor instance. This is important. We're going to see that in just a second. We also create a window and hook the two up together. And then the key thing here is on tick. And this is a very common thing. Basically, on tick means run the game loop, run the game loop, run the game loop. So what this is basically doing is the program starts up, it creates an editor, and then it loops forever, calling on tick as fast as it possibly can. Okay, so each time that on tick is called, we have the editor here. Um, the editor is really, really nice and clean. All of those windows we saw, things like the 3D viewport, the uh, 
the settings window, the assets window, all of that stuff, those are all widgets. So you're going to notice here under editor, we have a number of different widgets. So the asset widget is simply implemented as a widget. Well, let's go back here to the editor.cpp and you're going to notice what we do here in the editor is we create an instance of our engine. Engine is important. Obviously, engine is this side of the equation. Everything on the back end, the runtime side of things is in engine. So we create an instance of our engine and then we set up some subsystems. You're going to see this kind of approach quite a bit. There's a, everything is modular and in its own place. It makes it really easy to learn these things because if you want to learn about the profiler, you just have to go into that subsystem. But we set up the engine um, and then what you're going to notice here is once again, we have a function called so on window message, we come in here on tick. Tick is again important every pass through the game loop. We go ahead and first thing we do is we update the engine. So the engine has its loop. It is called the tick is there. It does all of its various different things in there. We're going to see that in just a second. And then what we do is we loop through all of the widgets. So all of those individual things that make up our scene. So if you've got your uh, your assets, your um, 3D viewport, your um, console window, all of those things, they have their own tick set up. The nice thing about this approach is if you want to create your own widget, basically just create a new one and then you just add it in here. Later on, you're going to see while well, we're creating this window, so we're in the uh, IM GUI initialize using the IM GUI library for all the visualizations. You're seeing here, it just creates a collection of widgets. So they're going to basically push this to the back of the list. So you're creating a shared pointer for a console, a profile, a resource, shader, editor, all of the various different things, the viewport, everything we saw is implemented as a widget. You just queue them all up. And then once again, each tick, each run through the flame. So in its own tick, it calls the engines tick and it calls the each widget gets updated. And that's kind of how straightforward it is. So now what we're going to do is jump over to the runtime side of the equation. So this is again, you'll see here in this loop here, um, it's calling tick in the engine every single time. So welcome now to the engine. This is the back end. Theoretically, if you're creating your own game, you just need to create this side and all of the stuff is provided for you from this side. Now, if you want to extend things, you're of course going to want to. So you can see here in the constructor for engine, we are again registering a number of subsystems. So everything is nicely broken down into very easily digestible parts. So you can see here the timer, the threading system, the resource cache, audio, physics, input, scripting, world, renderer, profiler, and settings, all of of those pieces are created as their own um, subsystem, although it does appear that tick has to come first. And then once it's all done, you initialize them all. And then you'll notice here, engine has its own tick. And what all it's doing is calling another tick, and this is context. Now let's go back up here. Context isn't really that confusing. Context is basically just kind of a wrapper between the engine and all the pieces of it. So you see right here, you're creating a new context right at the start of engine, and you're passing the engine into it. So that's where we're going to and the code journey is in context. Now go into context here, you're going to see that you have both a variable smooth tick rate, something for a different conversation, which I'm actually going to do in the near future. What we do here is initialize all we're doing is remember all those subsystems, you're just looping through them all. You're basically saying, okay, renderer, initialize, uh, timers, initialize, etc. You're just going through all of them and initializing them. And then we're back to that classic age old one of tick. And you're going to see here, all we do in engine tick, which we go back to all the way back here, this guy right there, this, all this is really doing is this. It's going through every single subsystem and calling its tick. Done. That's it. That's all you really need to know to understand this source code. So for each thing, if you want to get into figuring out how to, if you want to extend the editor, you go in here, say you want to, here's the assets. Here is how assets are implemented. So if you want to create your own, um, you know, UI interface for doing something special, you basically, you're just going to be implementing, let's go over here and take a look, a widget. And then over here, if you want to extend the game engine itself, coming into runtime, and you're going to see all these various different pieces. So for example, uh, the renderer, I believe was, let me see, renderer, the H, I subsystem. So you implement on the one hand, a widget, on the other hand, a subsystem, and then each one in turn. So you come in and take a look at it. When you want to jump in and try to figure out how things are working, all you really want to do is come in and find tick. And that is the thing. Here we go. This is called every single frame. So you're seeing all of the logic being called. Everything that's being done here is being called there. And you're going to have a little bit more of, so you're going to have to then jump into how the camera works and so on and so forth. But you're going to find this approach making everything as modular and clean as it is. It's one of the cleanest code bases I have seen for C++. And I highly recommend if you're looking to start out in the world of game engine development and you already know some C++ code, 
boom. And by the way, if you don't have the ability to understand anything I just showed you, chances are this isn't the right engine for you. It's not a knock on you and it's not a knock on the engine, but there is no documentation here. You either understand the code or you do not. But the nice thing is the code is very, very clean. So here we are now at the, um, the GitHub page for it. Uh, there's no license listed over here. I don't understand the inconsistency of, um, of GitHub's presentation, but you see down here, it is MIT license. The MIT license is very uh, flexible in what it allows you to do. You can make your own game engine from this one. As you can see, it's, for smart, uh, it's the result of his never ending quest to understand how things work and becomes his go-to place for research is designed around the philosophy of favoring fast real-time solutions over baked static ones. So instead you're getting completely dynamic lighting, for example, instead of baked light maps. Uh, so everything you're seeing is dynamically generated. Uh, it got a little bit more details come down here. Here are some of the technical specs. I covered a lot of these when we looked at the rendering settings of the engine itself. But you see here, uh, 10 font files, 20 image files, uh, 30, very symmetric and very nice linear progression going on here. But, uh, you got a number of font, audio, image, and model formats being provided. They're piggybacking on existing projects such as free type F mod, uh, free, uh, free image and ass imp. Uh, you got Vulkan and direct X 11 back end. There's a direct X 12 somewhere out there. It also uses the same, uh, HLSL shaders on the back end. So you don't need to worry about GLSL or other shader formats. Deferred rendering with transparency. It has principal BSDF supporting, uh, anastrop clear coat cloth materials and all the various different kind of mappings like you saw normal mapping parallax mapping inclusion mapping uh bloom based on the resident evil 2 engine uh volumetric lighting lights with physical units you know, we're using real world units same thing with the camera shadowing uh various different uh, screen space effects temporal anti-aliasing motion blur real-time shader editor built in there and on it goes. You've got full physics system and anti component system. Now, interestingly enough, you have C sharp support, and I never actually found it. No idea uh, how you do that. And that's one of those challenges with this engine. Again, no documentation. So you either figure it out yourself or it is not the right engine for you. And there's some things that they're looking at implementing. So here you can see. C sharp scripting isn't 100% in, so that that's kind of one of those things. Uh, DX12 is also a maybe, but right now Vulcan kind of uh, beat it, and you're going to see ray trace shadowing at some point in the future, skeletal animations, and so on. So uh, those are some of the things that they're going to be working on. Ultimately, even though you have no help, where you probably want to check out next, if you're interested, is their Discord server. And I will link this in the article down below. Uh, he does seem to be very active on it. It does seem to have a, it's a small, but, you know, it seems to be a friendly enough community from what I've seen. And so if, if you run into problems, that's probably where you want to go. But truth of the matter is, once again, if you don't have the ability to understand C++ code, at least the gist of it, this probably isn't the engine for you. But if you are looking to start out and learn how to create your own game engine, or you just want a better understanding of how game game engines work. This is some incredibly clean code that's constantly updated. You'll see here the last update was like two days ago. So he, he is constantly adding new features of functionality to this. Uh, between this one, the G3D innovation engine that I covered previously on the channel, and maybe Ogre 3D, uh, those would be where I would definitely recommend you start if you want to look at some good C++ code for how to set up your own game engine. And that's it. That is the Spartan engine. Let me know what you thought um, in the comments down below, and I will talk to you all later. Goodbye.